Welcome, everyone, to Music Junkies, a podcast about people sharing extraordinary stories about how music has impacted their lives. Welcome, everyone, to Music Junkies. I'm your host, Annette Smith, and today we have Rana Davis. She, you know, I'm so excited that you said yes to this podcast when I, you know, when I reached out to you. I know that you have emerged from the entertainment industry as a powerhouse female, which I love, right? You, you know, Thanks. you're bringing compelling characters to life on screen as an actor, calling all the shots behind the screens as a director and a producer, which is awesome. And then your amazing, amazing podcast that I can't wait to get into too. So thank you so much for joining me today on Music Junkies. Oh, I love that opening. Thanks for having me. Look, I clap for myself and you. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. So I always like to my, ask my guests what their experience was putting their playlist together. But I know that you had a little bit of a different experience putting your yes. playlist together. Can you just share a little bit about your different experience? Yeah. So last year I put out a best-selling novel called Secret Life of a Hollywood Sex and Love Addict. And when I was writing the book based on my life, I did a playlist and my husband was like, you should put the playlist in the back of the book so people can see what you slash Roxanne, the main character goes through and what music inspired you during the writing during that period of your life. So I said, okay, I'll put it in the back. So the last minute before I went to publishing, we, I wrote out all the descriptions and put in the playlist. So yeah, it was literally at like the hundredth hour. It was crazy. And so now I'm here to, to share it with you. That's awesome. I love it. And it's such an interesting story because obviously I've never had a story like that before, which I think is so cool that you hear you wrote a book and then you had, you created a pay- playlist for that. Yeah. And maybe you should put like a little CD at the end of the book. Maybe. I mean, I put it on Spotify so you can get it on Spotify, but yeah, that may, maybe who knows that could be the next step. Who knows? <laughs> So I want to, I'm excited about diving into your playlist, but before we get started, I'm like a huge True Blood fan, like huge. Um, And so I have a question to ask you. Okay. Okay. Marry, kill, or fuck. Okay. 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 So are you ready? (laughs) Yeah, I'm ready. I'm ready. (laughs) Okay. Suki, Eric Northman, or a seed? Oh my God. Oh my God. I don't, that's a hard one. Oh my God. Well, I wouldn't want to marry any of them. A couple of them, maybe I'd fuck and I probably kill one, but I can't say who. So you have to guess. It's like, you can figure it out. (laughs) I love it. How was your experience being on the show? Like, did you get to see, obviously there is a lot of you know, blood and gore and all that, like a lot of making in behind the the scenes to create like probably little parts of that show all the way through. Were you a part of a lot of that? Did you get to see a lot of that stuff? Yeah, I was on the last two seasons. Um, I played Belinda. She was one of the waitresses in the flashbacks was with um, everybody in the diner. So I got to hang out with everybody, but then I get killed in the last two episodes, you know, I get like dragged off and killed. So yeah, I mean, you're in any, being an actress, one of the main things is you're like going to be around blood. I've done so many horror sh- movies and you, you're going to be around like over sexualizing, which doesn't lead to my addiction and sex and love addiction at all, but like you see everything. And so when I watch a movie now, I'm like, this will happen before that. And that blood is all like sticky and you're uncomfortable. So I like know all that behind the scenes where it's, it looks better on camera than what the the actor is going through for sure. What was your favorite part about being on that show? I think just the camaraderie and it was such a machine because it was on for so many seasons before I went in for it. And when I got the part, it was like a machine. We were shooting two episodes at a time. So it was like back to back to back. So like part of the cast was shooting one episode and the other episode. So it was just like this amazing machine. Sometimes you go on sets and they're like hot messes and you're like, oh my God, this is like, get me off this set. But True Blood was one where it was really enjoyable and everybody was really happy to be there and they weren't jaded. Um, Sometimes the long running shows, they're a little jaded and over it and not on that show at all. 
That's cool. That's true. It probably would be, you know, you're working with the same people, Mm -hmm. you know, you're on like season 11 and you're like, no, but he's really not my brother. And I would really like to. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. No. And I'll, I'll give you one. Well, two shows were like that. And one of all, one of them I'll say, cause people have written about it was Desperate Housewives was one where like, they were just over it. And CSI, uh, the Miami one, people were over that. I was on that show twice and yeah, but other shows too, but I won't, I can't tell you those. <laughs> I'll get in trouble. <laughs> my agent and my man, they'll be like, what are you talking about, Brian? <laughs> like, stop talking. <laughs> Right, we're gonna start with your first song. Is it Fuck You Noah? Is that what it is? Yeah, it's Fuck You Noah by Noah Cyrus. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. What's I mean your that experience or memory behind that song. Well, here's the thing. That song, when I heard it, it's it spoke to my the narcissism of sex and love addiction. It spoke to the selfishness. You know, our society portrays so badly how like fan, uh, romance and fantasy and finding a soulmate and like it all being about you. Like we're so entitled. And so when I heard that song, it was like took me back to my not childhood, but my adolescence when I first acted out AK in my recovery is um, I became like had these narcissistic tendencies and she's singing about like, I'm a narcissist. I am selfish. Like I am a horrible person. So for me, I really wanted to put that at the beginning with Roxanne, the main character that is a fictional character of me. And she's just like living in her disease of narcissism. So when did you like, when did you know that you, that was kind of going on in your life. Was it fairly early? Maybe you didn't know the terminology. And then you look back and you're like, holy cow, I was like that at 12. Like that's probably not. Yeah, I mean, it was, that was a deep dive. You know, when you're in doing in a 12 step program for sex and love addiction, you have to go back. You always have to look back at the why. And that's really like the fourth and fifth step. So when I was doing that, I got to see, oh my God, like how selfish, self-seeking all about me. What can I get a taker, a taker, a taker. So for me, that song really represented that self-involvement of youth, you know, that a lot of youth have, but I just didn't grow out of it. You know, like I carried it on through my early twenties and, and I still believe society tells people that that's okay, how to behave. And it's not, but I think it just represents like that whole acting out and being selfish with other people's emotions and feelings. Do you see that a lot right now on social media? Oh my God, it's plaguing our society. It's just amplified. I have to say like more youngsters are coming into Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous. What I've been in for almost 13 years, 12 and a half years of recovery. I have 19 year olds, 20 year olds coming in and saying, I cannot connect to other humans. I'm so disconnected. I have this unrealistic expectations of what people should look like or how sex should feel from the porn industry or just like those filters. And then like trying to connect over social media is like, you might as well be connecting with a wall. First of all, text is not a form of communication at all. And then DMing with some stranger on Instagram, that's like te- not connection. You're literally talking to yourself, really. Yeah. When, uh, when my son was probably 16 years old, mm-hmm. um, and this is probably when social media was just start, like Facebook was just starting out. It's like seven in the morning. I come down to the office. I'm going to like whatever, do my normal routine. And Facebook's wide open. And there is like, picture after picture of picture of this young girl, like a young girl, probably like 14, 15, 16. And there's my son holding his dick in his hand. And I'm like, oh my God, it's seven in the morning. So now I'm reading and my son could be like a romance novel. Like I'm like, where did he learn all like (laughs) ABCs and all of this stuff? And I'm like, what is happening right now? And then I Uh really didn't even know how to address it because it was so new out there. Like I didn't even hear of anybody doing this. Mm -hmm. So I printed everything off and he came from, from school. I printed everything off and I just kind of put it across the table. And I was like, Hey, do you want to maybe explain this to me? And how proud he was that 
in a sense, like as a guy who was like, I'm super proud that, you know, I'm having these kind of conversations with, with girls. And I'm like, this is insane. Like, this is not real. Yeah. It's not real. It's fake intimacy. Like he thinks he's connecting with this other girl and he's really not. And it's just like breaking my heart because I can't imagine growing up with social media back then. Like I probably would have killed myself. I know I, you know, already had moments where I was like, I don't want to be on this planet in it anymore. I'm in so much pain, but I can't imagine what the youngsters are doing to themselves right now. The fantasy, the intrigue, the romance, the flirting, the desexualizing each other yeah. so much, the disconnection. It's really, it's an epidemic, they said, that it's happening right now. Yeah, it's crazy to think that you would go and like, that the that's the expectation. I go swipe right now. Yeah. And we're meeting and I'm sucking your dick in your car. Like, yeah. I, I miss the... <laughs> I miss it. Where's the romance? <laughs> I miss the 15 dinners. Like I miss I the know. like meeting at the mall, maybe <laughs> holding hands on the fourth date, you know, a nice kiss. You're like, but here's the thing. And that's, and I work with a lot of young, younger, like early twenties and they were telling me, you know, you remember how exciting, like the first kiss or those things used to be, they, uh, they're not excited about it anymore. Like it's nothing. It doesn't mean anything to them. And it just, it just, it's so sad. And that's why I spoke out. That's why I wrote the book. So anybody can pick it up, especially this younger generation and go, oh my God, me too. Oh, I keep going back to that unavailable. Oh, I'm over-sexualizing myself. Oh, I use my sexuality as a currency to get what I need to take from others. Like I put it all in the book to help other people. And that's why I spoke out last year. It's good. It's amazing. And, and I love it. I actually just ordered your book today. I'm going to ask you though, cause I, I do want like a little signed copy sent to me. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I remember back then, cause like my kids are 24 and 26 now, but I even remember back then, I don't know if you remember the bracelets that the girls used to wear. They used to like in Canada, they used to wear these bracelets and these bracelets um, stood for what they would do. Oh my God. No, I do. I've never heard of that. Like I would do anal. I'll give you a blow job. I'll let you give me a hickey. Like literally. Were they like charms and they just no, have they their like, like plastic colored bracelets? Well, I know for a long time, like the gay community, the gay men would have tattoos to say if they're a top or a bottom, but I've never heard of that at all. Wow. Crazy. Yeah. It's, wow. it's insane. I can't even imagine raising young kids now. Oh, don't even get me started. I have a four-year-old. <laughs> like I'm, I, the, he tries to touch my phone and I'm like, don't touch it. Don't touch my phone. You can't because it's such an addictive thing. And that's what leads to that disconnection. And I'm really trying to protect him from that. I'm trying to protect him from this world that so many young kids are getting sucked into. Yeah. It steals your soul. Yeah, it does. It does. All right. Next song. Hey. No, Billy, I haven't done that dance since my wife died. You don't want to know. Strange Addiction. Yes. Yeah, so that song, it really, really, well, I mean, it's perfectly titled. She talks about self-medicating with another human being, right? So for the longest time in my addiction, and you can read about it in the book, is I would hoard people. I would, like, go out into this world and find somebody that got me high, made me like falling in love. I love falling in love with people. And then the moment it like turned sour, I would still hoard them and keep them because I was so depleted. So it really talks about, you know, her being self-medicating with other people that it, it the person she's addicted to like sets her body on fire. And that's what this, this whole addiction is. It's that like high of somebody, attention, validation, sexuality, all of that. So I love that song. I think it perfectly represents sex and love addiction. It, go listen to the lyrics of that song. So would you just have like a core group of people that would give you something that you would want? And even though if it was turning sour, you still continue to have them in your life because they were feeding some something for you. And then yeah. if they weren't feeding what you needed, were you easy to quick to draw? No, that's the thing. I was a hoarder of people. So a lot of sex and love addicts, they, you know, 
they fall in love with somebody, they portray themselves a certain way. And when it starts going sour, instead of being, you know, an, a good person saying, hey, this is not working anymore for me, I'm gonna go date somebody else. I would literally keep that relationship and then start another relationship. So I was a, like, a, I was a cheater, you know, I was a cheater and a liar and a thief. So that's how I, how I refer to myself and Roxanne in the book. Oh, that's really interesting. I wanna switch gears. Do you remember your first concert? My first concert, um, no, but I do remember I I I had this one concert. It was for what was that band? Oh, Dave Matthews band. Because oh. I grew up in the South, and the Dave Matthews was when they came out. It was really popular, yeah. and my best friend would make me go to the Dave Matthews band with her. And I swear to God, I wanted to like slit my throat. Like <laughs> I'm like I, I cannot listen to these songs anymore. So that was like a concert I saw a lot where I was like, stop, enough. <laughs> that band might want to be, you know what? Maybe we should uh, be a little bit more up. Uh, you know, it's weird. Our following, you know, diminishes quite regularly. <laughs> we might want to change the tempo of our music. Oh my God, it was terrible. <laughs> oh, that's that like a snooze would... fest. <laughs> I feel that way a little bit with Our Lady Peace. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember your high school graduation song? No, uh -uh, I do not remember that. Here's the thing, you know, with this addiction, and I'm going to keep going back to it because it's like the whole point why with sex and love addiction, you tend, okay, here's the gist. When you're addicted to something, you're addicted to the high. And what you're doing is you're denying feelings. So if I'm, I, we sexualize stress, guilt, loneliness, anger, anger, shame, fear, and envy. So if I'm feeling sad, I like push it down and we'll go flirt with somebody at the coffee shop, let's say. Right. Yeah. And then I feel better about myself because I just been validated, which if you know anybody, they'll like be sad and go look on Instagram and they got a bunch of likes. So then they feel better. So that's the, this addiction. So when you're not feeling sadness or good times and you're suppressing them, you don't feel anything. Oh, wow. And you forget. And so I blocked out a lot of my childhood in my brain. So like good times, I can't remember because those have been blocked out because I blocked out the bad times as well. You know, I blocked out the molestation. I didn't remember. I blocked out things from my past and you can't block out one. Everything gets blocked out. So I forget things like what, who, when was this? When did you see this? Do you remember when you watched this movie? Like, I can't remember sometimes. So when things come back, like you were saying about the molestation. So when mm -hmm. that came back, obviously it was later on in life. Yeah. Did you remember like every little, like, does it bring you back to remember every little detail? Not necessarily just that, but just certain no. issues. I mean, when something gets unlocked in your subconscious and see, so, so I did like nine years of therapy twice a week, plus step work, plus sponsors, plus sponsoring people, you know, and going to meetings, you know, a couple of times a week in sex and love addiction. So when those things get on unlocked, sometimes it's not the full story. It's just snippets. So for me, like the molestation, I don't actually remember it. I just like remember the location, like laying down in the leaves, like the feeling of the leaves and this color of the sky. And that's what I remember and recall. So you don't al always get the whole vision back. You think people, that's the scary part. That's the scary part of the high is to give up is to remember Maybe yeah. I mean, that's what you run from. You run from those memories. You run from those trauma that happens, even generational trauma, you know, that goes down from generation to it's suppression. It's it's that's what it is. Every time I like find a new boyfriend, I'm pushing down something from the past. Every time I buy a new dress, I'm pushing something down from the past, eating too much cake, going on Instagram like as an addict, you're just suppressing everything. Did, was there just a realization that you're like, I need to do something about this? Yeah, it was my dark night of the soul moment is what I call. I write about in the book where I had this moment of that I looked in the mirror and I was like, I can't do this anymore. It can't be every, all these guys 
are not right for me or not, you know, it doesn't work out or they're not my soulmates. Like the common denominator in all these relationships is me. Something in me is broken. Something is wrong. So I had that moment, like, am I going to be doing this the rest of my life? Am I going to be going on movie locations or working and flirting with people I don't even like? And I talk about that a lot. A lot of it is like, I don't even like that person and I'm going to sleep with them. Like, what is wrong with you? Like, that's insane. Like connect those dots. And so I got to really have that moment at a hotel I'm not going to tell you where what movie location but like sitting in dark night of the soul in it and saying I can't do this anymore am I going to be 80 and on my deathbed and never fully connected to another human on this planet like that to me was torture and my dog is scratching <laughs> what are you doing stop she's like <laughs> What are you doing? She never right, does that. You're in. It's all sorry, good. sorry about that. It's okay. <laughs> she literally there started scratching. Sorry about that. I love that. that you said that because I'm I just for me personally, I'm a big believer that if you you have to, you might have to get to some spot in your life, and this is for everybody else, but for me, mm-hmm. I needed to just know that this was the time. So I remember getting high all the time and I remember exactly like wake. I was laying in my bed. I literally thought I was at a rave, right? I thought I was still at the rave. I could hear the music and I opened my eyes and I was in my bed and I thought, I can't fucking do this anymore. Mm -hmm. And I remember that that day led to so many things like that day led to me like literally writing letters to like all those people that I hung out with mm-hmm. and like going and putting them on their car windshields and like never talking them to it again, like, ever, like still to this day. Yeah. And I think back to that and I go, geez, that's so crazy. There were so many people. Was that letter so bad that they didn't even want to reach out again? That's, but it's almost like, thank God they didn't in a sense, yeah. you know? But yeah, you cut the ties. Yeah. And it felt good. Like I look at, I look back now and and I'm so grateful for that, but I just feel like some people think, oh yeah, like they just, um, it's like premature. Yeah. I'm going to do this. I feel like sometimes you just have to get to a breaking point that. Well, it's your bottom. Yeah. It's literally where you meet yourself. It's like you meet yourself and definitely like the next song goes to the, what we're talking about, but like you meet yourself and you have to make that decision. Am I going to change now and going to get worse and like maybe not survive? Or am I going to pivot and go down another road and become a different person, like a better person? Yeah. So we're going to play your next song. Okay. The subject. (laughs) Feeling used, but I'm still your kiss against my lips. And now all this time. I hate you. I love you. Mm -hmm. I hate you. I love you. And when you listen to that, it really like goes to like, you think visualize it could be like a partner, a loving partner. But for me, when I was putting it in the book and, and even talking to myself, it was to myself, like, I hate you. I love you. Like, I hate that. I want you. Like, there's a part of me. And for the longest time I battled with myself where I loved parts of myself and I hated parts of myself. And it's like, can you accept the good and the bad? Can you accept the dark and the light and also surrender that old self, that old dark self? And it was, it, it's a bat, it was a battle, especially that first year of recovery. You know, I had nine months where I cried every day and I wanted to literally unzip from my skin and crawl out of my skin. But then at the same time, I wanted to put my skin back on and, and go back and be the old me. So what would be different, you know, I look at kind of me giving up drug use Mm -hmm. where I kind of like let everybody go. And I, I, I don't want to say ran, but in a sense I could run from that. Right. I could move, I could, you know, not, you know, delete those contacts, all of that kind of stuff. Not go to the liquor store, you know, not, you know, go to the bars. So how, how, were you able to kind of break those ties with that? Because I feel like it, it is an addiction, but it's a little bit of a different type of an addiction. Well, it's the PhD addiction. Just so you know, like we have um, addicts that are in 33 years of recovery and AA coming in going, I don't want to come to this program. Like this is the one, like AA is the last house on the block, as you know, and like slaw 
Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous is like the shack in the back, like no one wants to go to. They like, so what's really underneath any addiction is religion right is that codependency or even that al-anon but sex and love really hits on every like attachment to anything attachment to relationships with family friends and partners so doing that like withdrawal or surrendering yourself yeah. is like torture i can't even describe to you because we have people and i, I wrote about it in the book uh, at six months, Roxanne and myself, I was getting my six months chip in LA speaking at a meeting. And this guy came in and he said, I can quit heroin, but I can't quit her. And it was such a light bulb moment of how brutal this peeling of old self, old addict self, old behaviors. I mean, just for me, and we call them bottom lines. And I talk about this a lot in the book for Roxanne, her, a lot of her bottom lines are my bottom lines. And it's like no talking, texting, or emailing any men whatsoever. No guy friends, no sex the first year of recovery. And I was living with my boyfriend, FYI. That's how brutal it is, if you can imagine. But I would go to a restaurant and can't even make eye contact with a waiter because I was constantly giving off that energy, like, like, like give me raping other people yeah. of their energy. So if you can imagine you're getting sober from alcohol and drugs and you walk outside and everywhere you look, there's a bottle of vodka. Like that's what it is. I walk outside and I'm addicted to people. I'm addicted. I snort and drink people. That's the best way I can describe it. I, so it's very black and white with drugs and alcohol. Mm. You just don't do it. You don't do it. You don't go to the places, but here's the thing. I can't not see people. I can't not go to the grocery store. I cannot just like a food mm. addict has a really hard time and it's a really hard addiction and it's not curable. It's not curable. It's you can learn tools to not be in your addiction. And it's like that way, but it's not curable. I'm forever going to be a sex and love addict. I'm going to forever love attention and validation and flirting and all of that stuff. And, you know, over-sexualizing just to like not feel my feelings, but I now have the tools where I don't go to that anymore. Does that make sense? Yeah, it totally makes sense. You ever have a breaking point that you just wanted to break it and fall off the wagon when you were- I mean, you yeah, were but yeah. I, I just surrounded myself. I never s slipped ever. You know, we call them slips. I'm sure that's what, you know, an alcohol as well, but when you slip and slaw, slip and slaw, that sounds so funny. <laughs> but when you do, it's really hard to come. It's it's really hard. There's not a lot of sobriety in my program. I'm an old timer with 12 and a half years. You know, there there's probably 5% of the people still there. So I had moments where I would make eye contact. I have this rule even with my clients and you make eye contact and you literally, I would close, look down look down. And sometimes at the beginning, I would say, you cannot make eye contact with anybody, but I would look down and I would run. If I found them attractive, I would run the relationship through my head very quickly. Like, oh yeah, we'd fall in love and it'd be amazing. And then, oh, then we have to take out the trash and then we have to pay the bills and then we have to pick up dog poop. So I get to pass the fantasy and into reality. And that really helped me never slip. Oh, wow. Yeah. So do you have any embarrassing things that turn you on? Yeah, well, the next song actually. Oh, is it? <laughs> yeah, it does. Play the next okay. song. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Inspiration, Chicago. I love it. Chicago. Okay, so like, Here's the funny story is when I would go to my slaw meetings, you know, you can read about it in chapter, chapter two and three, but like when I would go after a sex and love addict meeting, I would get in my car and listen to love songs at, at like nine 30 at night, right? Driving, <laughs> driving on the one Oh one highway blasting. You're my inspiration. <laughs> and it was like my 
turn on in my like fantasy in my mind for the longest time since I was like 13 years old is that someone would call and dedicate a song to me mm. on you know on love songs Di- D- Delilah it's Delilah's love songs on 103.5 or something like and like I would then drive over to their house and then we'd be like together forever. Like that was like my fantasy. So I have Roxanne driving from her first sex and love addicts meeting, listening to love songs and then getting a text from like her ex and it like meaning something. And then she goes and sees him and she like falls off the wagon. So I put that in there in the representation of like, I'm addicted to love songs. Like I, that's why I became an actress. My therapist, Dr. Kath in the book, she literally was like, you picked the worst career for your addiction. You live in fantasy and romance. And it's true. I did. <laughs> it's been one of your favorite films that you've did. Favorite films. I really love Synchronicity. It's an, it was an independent film and then Magnolia Pictures picked it up, but I just love Abby in it. She's so smart. She's a scientific science fiction writer and she's just it's about time travel it's beautifully shot i got to dye my hair dark brown and cut it all off and i just it's such a beautiful film and it it talks about you know evolution and time travel and all that so i really love that um and then i just really love the one i just did which they changed the name after my book came out it's called uh secret life of a celebrity surrogate and my husband directed it and i play this character um, Ava, she is like a nutbag, like total love addict, total. And she's like, goes crazy over love and, and validation and attention. And it was such a fun part to play. And it's on Lifetime right now. And I'm really proud of it. And it's beautifully shot for a Lifetime movie. Um, and I love the show Six I did on History Channel. I just love that character as well. <laughs> so you, and it's Mark, right? Your husband. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's my husband's <laughs> name. <laughs> You guys have been together for how long? 17 years. Wow. So that's so he the was kicker. going through you. Going, he was with you while you're going through all of this stuff. Yeah. The difference, you know, everybody says, you know, is Roxanne you? And I said, yes, it is me. You know, I wrote it. The I wrote it in 45 days, the book, and it was purely nonfiction. But when I started rewrites and with the editor, I just all these dreams and stories and other people's stories. So I just put it all in there to like make an evolved character of sex and love addiction. Like I said, so anybody can pick it up and go, Oh my God, I did that. Or my friend does that. Or like, so the kid, the difference between Roxanne and I, she's single and through most of the book, but I actually was in a relationship. So I went through sex and love addiction after our fourth year together. So I hit my bottom and almost blew up my relationship with my live-in boyfriend. Who's now my husband. Mm -hmm. And yeah. So we've been together 17 and a half years. And, you know, that's the thing. It's like this addiction can ruin your life and ruin a good thing. And it can make you pick unavailable people. And luckily my God, our higher power put me with someone that understands addiction. He has 33 years in AA, 10 years in DA, like he works a solid program. So he understood my addiction had nothing to do with him. It had to do with the emptiness inside of me. So the point is you don't go through this program or this work to find like, you're trying to get married. Like, it's (laughs) like, here's the thing. I used to be addicted to him. But now we both worked on ourselves and we were willing to let go of each other to do that work. And, and we got, I got to stand on my own two feet. So which that means like all the grieving Roxanne did, I did. I just did it with someone there. So I cried for a year. Like I said, I, when I would be crying, he couldn't comfort me. He couldn't talk to me about my problems. He wasn't allowed to fix it for me. Yeah. So yeah, it was brutal. It was don't, I don't ever do this work with somebody who's absolutely brutal, but it, but it's the best work ever. I am curious though, because obviously you started that relationship like that. So Mm -hmm. you did certain things or you, you know, I don't know, you had certain habits or triggers with him and maybe he didn't really realize that that's who you really were back then. And then you start doing all this work and can you look across the room and be like, Hey baby, I, you know, or is it like, no, whoa, whoa, that's a trigger. No, you can't do that. Like we had can't. a couple of times when that happened, when he was like, whoa, the inner, like your addiction is coming out. Like we had a couple of times, but he was recovered enough to see it. 
You know, he was doing the work. He was doing the years of recovery and therapy himself. So if he wasn't, it could have gone down badly south, like really bad, really fast. But we were both so willing to grow and to not be comfortable and to not go back to our old roles in the relationship that now we like stand as two individual people that are walking this earth together. And if he left me today, I would be okay. I would be sad. I would, he's like my best friend as well, but it's like, he doesn't complete me. And I never knew that. I never knew that a relationship isn't meant to complete you. Like my, and the sex isn't meant to like mean everything in the world. So like, Sex is the icing on the cake. The whole cake is what's important. All the ingredients, not just like romance and love. It's like all the ingredients of your life makes this beautiful cake. Yeah. What do you love most about Mark? I think his he's funny as fuck. <laughs> he's smart. He's so smart and he's so talented. He could literally do anything. It's almost irritating. I love it, but it's irritating. Like he can figure out anything, do anything, produce anything. He's so talented, but he's also really humble and empathetic and kind and gentle. Um, he makes, he's in a beautiful father. Like I almost sometimes see him with my son and I'm like, my son is so lucky. Like, I wish I had a parent like that. When like, I get a little jealous, like my little yeah. inner child is like, I wish I had a parent like that. <laughs> um, but he's a great, he's a great person. And I'm really lucky that he's standing next to me on this earth right now. So what's one thing that he lets your son do that you would not let your son do? Well, he's a pushover. He's definitely <laughs> nicer than me. <laughs> like he makes me a nicer person. You know, I'm very like, no, no. And he can, he can give a little bit. And sometimes Davis turns to him after I say no. And he's like, can I, and he'll look at him and go, you just asked your mom. And she said, no, don't try to manipulate me. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, um, so he, he's a bit of a more pushover than I am. Sounds like a great guy. He is a great guy. You would love him. Next song. Okay. You say. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful song. Oh, it's so beautiful. I mean, that song is like, I don't know. It's like that inner battle with yourself where you think God doesn't love you. And I, for so long, had that battle my entire life where I had this, I had this God or higher power universe where anything good I did, it was because I did it. <laughs> like I'm important. I made it happen. My hard work and anything bad though, I would blame to God and say, you did this to me, blah, blah, blah. But then I also had a God that was a jokester. Like he would dangle carrots and say, oh, this is almost yours. And as soon as I like reach for it, or really wanted it, you know, especially with my career and jobs and things or people, he would like swipe it away. Right. And so I always had this love hate relationship with God where I was like, well, not really love, just hate. Like he didn't take care of me. And this song really represents the journey of surrendering, you know, the step three, which is really still hard for me, you know, turning my will and my life over to the care of God as I understand God, because I don't understand God and I can't see, touch, feel, whatever my God looks like. Yeah. But there comes a time when you just have to like, see that you're this small on the earth. You're like a worker among workers and that everything in the universe is attached and we all are connected and there's something bigger going on. And sometimes you have to like take those ugly moments and then look back five years later and say, oh, that's why this is happening. I had to evolve to get to here. And so it was this big journey for me and this song really represented it. I'm like gonna cry, really represented in me like surrendering to like a power greater than myself. And that it's that, I'm taken care of even when the hard times are happening. So it would look like this, like I'll give you an example. So uh, that nine months where I cried every day, yeah, I literally had moments where I would sit on the bed and like be grieving like a snake was coming out of my soul. I'm not kidding. Like I, I, I my mouth wouldn't close, tears would be falling down my face and I'd be like, <laughs> just this pain that was stored for so long in my body. And I would look at a clock and then I would look at the clock when I finally stopped crying and like 50 minutes passed of me having this exorcism of pain coming out of my body. And I remember the whole time 
This is good. This is God taking care. I have to grieve to get this out of my body because that pain turns into disease. That pain turns into more yeah. addiction. So um, that was really like that grieving process really allowed me to go through that darkness and knew that I had something bigger than me taking care of me. Yeah. Did you do anything? Was there something that comforted you? Well, there is one thing I talk about and I talk about in the book, Roxanne does it too, is like, I got a little doll. My therapist made me get a little doll and put it, carried around with me and put it in my purse. And like, um, it was like my little inner child I was taking back, you know, taking around with me parenting now, you know? (laughs) (laughs) Have you ever heard of Hoffman? Hoffman? No, mm -mm, I don't think so. It's a... It's a, a kind of a really cool place that you go and you do all this kind of spiritual healing and you kind of let go and you bury your parents and you do all this kind of crazy stuff. Um, but there is, there's no talking, right? Only time you talk is during session, which is like traumatically hard for me. Um, and I cheated through the whole thing. Cause I, you know, you, you're with a roommate and it's like, can we whisper? Can we, like, I couldn't handle it, right? You couldn't handle, you couldn't handle being with just yourself. <laughs> Wow, you sound like everybody in this world right now that can't just be. We did a lot of inner child work. so. Oh my God, I did so much inner child work and Jungian therapy and like DBT and like all of that. Like, uh, yeah. Yeah, it never ends. And and then you always find something different. You're like, oh, I'm going to try this. This sounds really cool. I'm going to try this. I haven't evolved yet, right? I still got lots of pain. I still want to go... And then I don't want to say it becomes addicting, but I actually love doing personal development. I love it. It's like, I'm constantly looking for the next, you know, what can I do? I like to be that person where somebody's like, oh, hey, have you did? I'm like, oh yeah, I've did that. Yeah. I've like landmark momentum, (laughs) all of that stuff. I've done all of it, but I'm actually in a place now after 12 and a half years. I don't know how long you have, but like, I don't look for that stuff. But then if something comes to me organically, like you just said, and like, oh, have you tried this? I'm like, no. So like recently I've been going to this guru that you cannot find anywhere. It's like only word of mouth in LA. It's like, although like A-list people use him and he like does this body work and it was intense. Like, so I'm doing that now, but yeah. Oh, I love it. <laughs> Look at you. You're like, can I get his name? I'm like, I'll DM you later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, it's so low. Three years of therapy still hasn't got me right. As the wake <laughs> of crying on the floor. Sadness. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that one is really hits where you like have to be okay with your sadness. Like I said, it's like it from like finding the God and then being okay with your sadness because for so long I was running from my sadness. Um, that that song really represents me going through the rest of the withdrawal and doing the step work and stuff and being okay. Like almost the sadness is my friend. What, as you were going through that, was there a piece of advice that somebody gave you that you just kind of held on to? Mm -hmm. Was there a lot of people giving you advice at that time as well? It was interesting. I mean, you get little nuggets from people's shares, but I definitely, you know, Alice, who's my sponsor in the book, that's not obviously her real name. And then my therapist, Dr. Kath, which that's not her real name either. Um, gave me the most wisdom and that's why they're represented in the book so much but there was this one nugget that really really helped me and I I even wrote about it in the book with Dr. Kath is she said you have to dig through your shit to get to your gold so digging through the shit is going into that sadness you like you have to dig through the shit in your soul so she would do this motion for me to see like you have to dig I'm like doing hand motions digging down to get to your goal because the shit is bearing like your true, authentic, beautiful self. And and she says, you have to dig through it, Brianne. You have to walk through it. You have to dig, 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 dig and get that goal. So like I said, every time I was sad, every time I'm like getting emotional, every time I was sad, I was like, I'm digging to get my gold. (laughs) You know, it just like gave me like, it's okay to have bad days. It's okay to not be okay, you know? But where we get in trouble is toxic positivity, like trying to run from your sadness. And for so long, it was 
I was leaning into that instead of just leaning into the sadness and just letting it be, letting yourself be sad. So, yeah. It's so important to let yourself be sad though. But yeah. so many people, we, you know, we portray, we want to portray this um, hard layer. And I think my whole life I've portrayed this really hard layer. Mm -hmm. And as I get older, I try to become a little bit softer, but I'm very, I'm very careful who I let into my personal space or know about my, my past history or, or anything like that, like very traumatic stuff and all this stuff. And I feel like everybody wants to know, do you know what I mean? Like if I meet someone like, oh, I really want to know about Annette's life. And that kind of creeps me out because I'm like, I don't know if I want you to know that part of me. It's not that I don't want to share, mm -hmm. but I think I've just went through so many people in my life that maybe have known that side of me and, and mm -hmm. aren't in my life anymore. And I'm not really open to doing that e even more. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that makes sense. So I'm, it very, makes sense. Protective. I'm, I'm very protective with what I share. I also don't like to get any type of victim role whatsoever. Right. Ah, oh, that's it right there. That's it. Ding, 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 ding. This, right? Because here's the thing. It's like, when I share my sadness, when I share my journey, the number one thing that keeps me sober is that connection is that with another person. And yes, it, like that was the one hesitation of me writing the book, you know, and coming out as a sex and love addict with my Huff Post article was like, why am I doing this? But it was after 10 years of recovery and all the work. So it's like, I stood in a place where it's like, here's my story. You do what you want with it. It yeah. doesn't define me anymore, but this is my story and I'm okay to share it. So I definitely used to have more of that protective vibe of my story. Yeah. Um, but it's interesting with you because it's that victim thing. You don't want to look like the victim. And that's interesting. That's right. We could have a whole session about that. <laughs> <laughs> we could, we could. I feel like I am like very, very good at getting people to really open up and sharing stuff with me that they would never, ever share. I feel like I have that really good rapport with somebody, but on the other side of it, they can't get me to do that. So it, it's very interesting sometimes. Really? Oh, yeah, it's interesting. It's I've always kind of had that. I, I don't know. So I used to be like that. I used to be a very private person. And like, you don't know, is that facade? My, my therapist even said, you like have a mask on top of a mask on top of a mask. But I think with this type of recovery that I've done, it's just made me more empathetic and um, to other people. So then it allows me to show the qualities I'm not so proud of the character defects. I'm not so, you know, usually like, Hey, this happened to me, or I'm like this or like that. So yeah. I understand. Yeah, I get it. And I know every time I do open up, people are like, Oh my God, you're being vulnerable. It's amazing. It is <laughs> open up. <laughs> open up. Okay. Next song. Okay. Help me. At 3 AM. And I was like, Oh my God, tell me your secrets. I'll tell you, tell you mine. Because what happened is Huff Post just came out before the book did. And it hit like 2 million hits in the first week. And I got inundated with so many emails and DMs saying, oh my God, me too. My mom was like that. My husband is like that. All these people. Um, and I just remember this feeling like that last bit of stigma and shame just kind of evaporated. So when I had that go, it was like I was a full person. And not just my inner circle or my friends around me knew I was in sex and love addiction. You know, it's not like I would go on set and say, hey guys, I'm a sex and love addict in recovery. <laughs> like, like, but I would definitely go on set, especially at the beginning, beginning and go, you're a love addict. You're sleeping with a wardrobe person. You're cheating on your wife. Like I would totally label people like completely. I couldn't help it because I was so surrounded by it. Um, but definitely I, um, what was I saying now? That got me all off track. I was saying, what did I, what was I talking about? What was we your talking. question? <laughs> <laughs> I can't even remember now. I just, now you got me confused. Cause I was like, so intrigued. Here. I know. <laughs> Look at this hot mess express. Oh, the podcast. About your podcast. So yeah. Okay. We'll cut now. We'll cut all that. But here. <laughs> so then when I did the Huff Post article and all that stigma and shame, and I was like free. I woke up the next morning going, 
oh my God, a podcast, Secret Life. Tell me your secret and I'll tell you mine. So I made it a point that every time I do a show, I have to reveal something about myself. Because if I'm not revealing something about myself, that doesn't help my recovery. Because walking into a room of 12-step or therapists or wherever, you have to reveal yourself. So I really wanted to make a, a show where it allowed other people to let go of their shame stigma, secrets, past, present, whatever. They could change their name. Most of our guests are anonymous. Um, we have really, really dark secrets. Uh, we have some light ones too that are funny and you'll crack up. But I knew we had something special when my first anonymous one is Kristen. It's episode five. You can listen to it. And she shot herself in the chest with a shotgun and survived, obviously. And walks me through why she did it because she couldn't reach perfectionism. And, and it was just such, I, I, it was, a, I was like an out of body experience where I was like, oh my God, this is so bigger than me. And yeah. we recorded 170 episodes and I still yeah. record some every once in a while, but we have enough for another two, a year and a half, I believe. And it's one of the best things my hu husband and I have produced together and done together. And I'm really, really, really grateful for it. Where can we find your podcast? Everywhere. <laughs> Secret Life. It's the pink with the finger going, shh. Is that your um, finger? No, that's not my finger. Uh -uh. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't put my picture on it. And I know a lot of actors do and do that, but I didn't yeah. want to make it about me. First of all, I'm not an A-list celebrity. I'm like, you know, I'm a working actor. I've been doing it for 25 years. I make a living at acting, but I'm not a celebrity by any means. I can walk down the street. And nobody comes at me barely. And it's like, I didn't want to make it about me. I didn't want to put my picture and like, you know, like not I wanted to make it. Finger either. It's no, like it's not my husband's <laughs> finger either. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So I'm just going to stop for a second. You're still okay to keep going. It's been an hour. So I don't know what you're. Oh, talking. I have to, I have to go soon. Yeah. I have a, I have a one. Is at there three. a song? Is oh, there a see. song? Yeah. The there's last? one I love here. Yeah. Do one? the, the Ava it. brothers. It's the, uh, where is it? Uh, no hard Number. feelings. is the last one. It's like okay. my all time favorite song. Okay. Perfect. We're already at your last song, which is so crazy, right? I definitely want to book another time and do like the other eight for sure. Yes. It's crazy how time flies when you're having fun. So here's I your know. last song. Are you ready? Yes. <laughs> 